so that the Chinese concepts of uh, fullness and emptiness. Um, so typically, or not typically, but the, the, the kind of uh, polarity that, that most people are uh, familiar with um, in terms of uh, Chinese cosmology as it relates to the human body are the concepts of yin and yang. So uh, yin and yang. Um, here with, with uh, yin, um, this in the uh, Shuan Jietze, the um, kind of an early uh, introduction to um, uh, what words mean, yin refers to the shady side of a hill. So if this were a hill, the shady side is yin, and then the sunny side is yang. So if the, the sun is here, kind of in the south, and it's shining on a hill, um, the yin side is the side that doesn't receive the direct sunlight, and the yang side is the side that receives the direct sunlight. So if you think about a hill that um, is sunny on one side and shady on the other, and the differences between those two sides, you immediately get a sense of um, what these terms meant to the early kind of Chinese um, uh, cosmologist. So on the shady side, you'd have more ferns, the soil would be moister and softer, um, things would be damper and cooler. Um, there would be different plants that would live on that shady side than the ones that would live on the uh, sunny side. On the sunny side, the plants would be more adapted to conserving water, not losing it. They'd be better adapted to um, kind of dryness and heat. And on the, uh, the north side, say, or the shady side, the plants would be better able to take advantage of the moisture, but um, would also be better adapted to uh, less light. And I think most people who have um, uh, even a, just a basic familiarity with Chinese cosmology can think in these terms, can think about yin and yang. So we might think of uh, something that's, that's warm and hot as being yang and something that's cold and wet as being yin. Um, however, there was an earlier, um, there was an earlier, um, I guess, cosmological pairing, one that that preceded yin and yang, um, and that is the concept, th these are the concepts of, of emptiness and fullness. So um, emptiness is written this way, and fullness is written like this. Um, this character, she refers to emptiness and she, uh, is fullness. Of course, our translation of this as empty and full, um, or we could think of it, there are many ways to translate it, but it's typically translated as, as empty and full. It's, it's not a perfect translation of the original Chinese. So if we look a little bit at this character for emptiness to start with, we can get um, more of a sense of the, the actual meaning of the character. So this concept, she, we have here this part at the top, which was originally a, um, a depiction of a tiger. So I can show you this, this part here was originally, in the Oracle Bond script was written something like this. So if you look at this kind of oracle bone script, um, you can kind of see this head with a large mouth and then some sort of eye here, the kind of curved back and the feet, and then some lines depicting the, the tiger's pelt. Um, and then this portion down here, um, in its earliest forms, it may have been, it may have represented like a hill or a position or something like that. But it may have also indicated uh, a general's or a high-ranking official's their their headdress, and um, one notion of this character is that it was she. It was an empty place, uh, sort of a spot where if you had a feast or some kind of ritual or rite, and there was a very high-ranking official that 
may or m might join the meeting or might not. They might be at the ritual event or they might not, but you would definitely have a place set for them in the event that they arrive. So you wouldn't have the, um, you know, the, this kind of elaborate ritual without at least um, making a place for them, allowing them to, to show up or to not show up. And you, you might not know because you're not in sort of, you're not in command of them. They're kind of like a, a higher kind of an independent entity. You might not know whether or not they would come, but you would definitely have a place for them set out. And the, the tiger pelt was often used as, um, you know, uh, accoutrement for um, if, if it were a king or a very high ranking official to kind of show their status. So in the place where they were meant to sit, you wouldn't have, um, you know, you wouldn't have like wolf hides or, or, or lambskins or something like that. You'd have the, the finest hide, the finest pelt that you could possibly put out there and the one that would kind of best resonate with their position. So in the, in the jungle in the, or the, the, the forest or the mountains, the, the king of that kind of sphere would be the, the tiger. The tiger was often referred to as the, the Da Chong. This, this Chong is, uh, it means worm, but it can also just mean creature. So the tiger was seen as like this, 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 the great, the great worm, the, 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 the you know, because it's this predator that could kind of trump any other, um, animal that was there in the, um, uh, in the forest or in, in the wild there. So they have this tiger pelt and then the, the headdress there would be maybe some ornaments or something like that to indicate where, you know, um, who was to be sitting there at that spot. So we kind of designate uh, a place for them and also designate who would be there. But whether or not they were there was up for debate. You know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know they were there. So this concept of it being uh, an empty place that was indefinite. It could, be, it could be full or it could be empty. That's this concept of, of emptiness. Um, and then she, the character she. We have this kind of roof or covering radical. And this part here is like a, uh, a cowrie shell or, you know, some, some form of, some kind of monetiza monetization, but some discrete um, element that could be traded or could be, um, you know, uh, um, in the early Chinese um, uh, society, the kind of earliest currency were these cowrie shells. And they were used as currency in many places in the world, but they were, you know, they were long lasting. They were beautiful, so you could wear them around your neck, but they're also kind of like a form of monetization. So you could trade so and so many cowrie shells for a particular thing. Um, and this part up here was originally written something like an I. Um, so seeing it, you're actually, you're actually seeing it there. This, this part here was, was originally written something, you know, like this which looks a lot like an actual eye there. And then here you have this, this, cover, this covering over the top. Um, so it's contained. So when you look at these two, these two concepts, in one you have this position where, there, where something could be there or could not be there. And then in this other, you have something that is, it's, it's not just like a place where someone could sit, but it's actually a covered, uh, structure or something. There's some kind of set cover, some kind of roof that's connected to the ground. The eye, the notion that it's actually being perceived, it's actually being kind of seen or noticed. And then you have this, this cowrie shell, which is something that can be counted. And it's it, not just that it can be counted, but it has a set um, kind of um, uh, a set nominalization. Like it's a, it's a, it has a particular value that's associated with it that is agreed upon consensually. Um, so this, is, this already becomes very interesting, at least to me, because in, this early, in the earliest cosmological model, it wasn't so much a notion of yin and yang, water and fire, dryness and, and heat, cold and uh, uh, dryness and, and dampness, cold and heat. It was the earliest cosmological model was a notion of a, a definite 
something being definite, something being solid, something being known, and that could be counted, that was solid, and then something that was indefinite, something that was unknown, something that was unclear. Um, this, I think, is this is, a, this is a fascinating thing to think about in terms of early Chinese cosmology and early Chinese thought, because when we look at the difference between um, uh, what you might think of as a Western understanding of the human body and of health and disease and a, uh, a Chinese, or I don't want to say Eastern, but a, a Chinese, a classical Chinese understanding of the human body, there are, there are two different models. So the, the Chinese model is inductive. And the Western model is, is causal. So when you think about the inductive model, the inductive model is there are two things separated in space. So they're not occupying the same place in the world. And this could be the, uh, this could be uh, the, the planet Jupiter rising on the horizon and the person's liver. So there are two things that are, that are separated in the, in the world, but somehow they are linked in terms of time. So with both the liver and the planet Jupiter, they're linked by this notion of the, the wood phase. So Jupiter was thought of as the Mu Xing, the wood star, and the liver is thought of as the, the wood organ, the, the, the Mu Zhang, the wood solid organ. Um, and in the Chinese understanding, there was a connection between those two things. It wasn't a, a causal connection, it was an inductive connection. So when something was going on with that planet, with the way that it was sort of presenting itself in the world, something that could be, underst that could be used to understand something that was going on in the human body. In the causal understanding of the body, and this is the one that we here in the West just think of as how the world works in general, two things are separated in time. So one follows the other, but they exist in the same place. So, you know, there's, a, there's this cloth that I used to erase the board, and I reach over to it, and then I pick up the cloth, and then I let go and it falls. There's a causal thing that's happening, but they're all connected in terms of place. And they're separated in terms of time, this kind of linear progression of time. So the, the, basic, the basic kind of understanding of the universe um, in the early Chinese uh, world is an inductive, uh, it's an inductive universe where things are connected even though they're not actually existing in the same locality. And the basic understanding of the world in, at least for the first part of the scientific revolution, was a, was a causal world, world. This is like the world of Newtonian physics, where things act on each other by contacting each other, by coming to the same place, and even though they're separated in time, A happens, A comes into contact with B, and then B moves somewhere, and something happens. Of course, this understanding, this, this causal understanding of the universe that we have made, it, it caused us to think of the, um, the inductive model of the universe as being nonsensical. So some of these, um, for instance, some of the um, early uh, Western proto-sciences like astrology, once the, uh, uh, this notion of this, this causal understanding of the world, this uh, uh, this things being separated in time but uh, existing in the same place once that became more dominant um, the uh, ideas like astrology where you have a, a planet that's just appearing in the sky or some conjunction of planets or some geometrical relationship of, of planets somewhere in the sky the notion that that would somehow have an effect or have or be some kind of indication of what's going on in the person we began to think of that as, as nonsensical. But um, later, later on in the development of science, once quantum physics and nuclear physics um, came to play, we, we realized that there really is what is referred to as um, 
this kind of spooky action at a distance. So um, if you think about quantum physics, one of, the, one of the greatest kind of riddles is how can two particles that are existing in you know, two different places in the universe that could be you know, more or less infinitely distant from one another, but you do something to one particle over here and it has an effect on the other particle over there. They're, they're separated in terms of place, but in terms of time, they're simultaneous. So I don't want to get into a long uh, discussion of quantum physics, but if you go onto YouTube and just look at, you know, look at some of the things that have come out of um, you know, modern physics, you realize that we are, now, we are now using what's essentially an inductive model of the universe to explain the, the most basic fabric of the cosmos. Now that, 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 um, that uh, understanding of the, of the cosmos, if you go back in time, say the very beginning of time, at the very beginning of time before all of the atoms had formed and before everything else had formed, you had these very basic particles that were neither this nor that, but were somehow um, you know, entangled with one another and are interacting with one another in a way that kind of defies our uh, present conception of uh, both time and space. Um, one of the um, things that um, Einstein struggled to explain was how it is that two things that are separated in space could act like they were occupying the, the same space. Um, and, and I don't, you know, hope to offer any kind of explanations of that. But um, the very notion of space, the very notion that things are actually separated in space comes into question. Just as the very notion that things are separated somehow in time can kind of come into question. So for the, for the earliest kind of Chinese cosmologists, they arrived at some very interesting um, understandings of the way that the universe formed that actually fit, um, I think, very, very beautifully with uh, um, uh, the kind of modern, the most current understanding of the um, uh, of, of cosmology, of scientific cosmology. So this this notion again of a shu. Um, we talked about how um, there's this sort of tiger pelt, and then there's this this kind of generals or high officials headdress there showing that that's where where they are but they, they could be there and th they might be there and they might not be there and that it, that that notion there is this notion of this what they call the, the superposition this superposition of a particle is this notion that it, it, it exists in a particular position but it's not until you look at it it's not until you actually try to examine it and see it, that it actually falls into one place or another. And one of the interesting things with quantum physics is, and the kind of the most basic kind of quantum physical experiments are, um, you can, humans, or we can cause a particle to fall out of the superposition and, and, and take up resonance and be in a particular place simply by monitoring it. So the, the most basic um, uh, uh, um, kind of experiment that demonstrated this and, and completely baffles me and, and uh, probably will boggle me for the rest of my life is you, you put two slits in a panel, a panel that doesn't allow light to pass through it. And then you have this panel set up like, like so, and you, you shine light through it. As it goes through the panel and it, and it casts its, its shadow on, on the wall, you'll have alternating bars of light and dark. And these alternating bars of light and dark are the result of the light passing through both of these slits. And because the light at this point is acting like a wave as it passes through and it, and it ca casts onto this, this panel here, because it's acting like a wave where you have peaks and troughs, like so, where the, where the peaks where the peaks cancel out the troughs, you'll get darkness. But where the the um, the peaks sum up together, where they connect together, you'll get light. So you'll get these bars of light and darkness that are cast here on this panel. What's very strange, though, is once you set up a monitoring device that a person is actually going to monitor, and you look for the light 
where you expect it to be, which is like say in the middle, and you set up a, a device there, then the light will collect here in a single area in the middle and there'll be a uniform, or not a uniform, but there'll be the expected distribution where you were looking for it. Now that sounds crazy, right? Because light is just out there in the universe. Why would it care whether or not we were looking at it? But this is the mystery of, of quantum entanglement. And for the early Chinese, strangely enough, they seem to already be onto this. If you look at this character, for sure, again, we have, they, uh, they had this notion of this eye, of something seeing it. So you have this, this kind of housing, this structure. Then you have this eye that somehow, once you look at it, once you look at it and you've monetized it, it goes from being a, a wave, this kind of in, indefinite thing, to being a particle, to being something that can be quantified. It's a, it's a quanta. So this notion of the cowrie shell, is, you could think of it as like a quanta, like I have seven of these, seven of these cowrie shells that I can trade you for, I don't know, an ax head or whatever they were trading for the back then, some twine to make a net with. So this, this early conception, I feel, of the, the cosmos really dovetails with the um, kind of modern quantum physics understanding. And I wanted to read um, some of the descriptions of the, um, the, the beginning of the cosmos. Um, this is from, a, um, this is from the, um, uh, the Huainanzi, which was a um, kind of an early cosmological text. I'm gonna read you a few different um, translations. Um, of this description of the, the beginning of the cosmos. So um, and this is from the Treatise on the Patterns of Heaven. It's chapter three of the Huai Nansa, and it begins with the lines, uh, when heaven and earth were yet unformed, always ascending and flying, diving and delving. Thus it was called the great inception. The Tao began in the nebulous void. Xu, the nebulous void produced space time. Space-time produced the primordial chi. A shoreline divided the primordial chi. So it's kind of, you know, obviously hard to understand, but this notion of everything being kind of diving and delving, and, you know, not having any kind of clear form or anything like that is very interesting. So um, that's one translation. Um, another translation, um, this is by Stephen Owen. Uh, he translated it as, before heaven and earth had shape, all was roiling, surging, billowing, whirling, thus named the visible. The way began in nothingness. Nothingness gave way to the universe. The universe gave rise to vital stuff, chi, and vital stuff possessed limit and boundary. But every time that they're saying nothingness, or every time that they're saying emptiness, they're not really saying nothingness or emptiness. What they're saying is this, again, this concept of chi, So in, the, in their understanding, in the, the beginning of the cosmos, there was, there, there was all this, I don't even want to call it stuff, but there was this state of the cosmos where things were indefinite. There, there, there was, you know, it, it was neither this nor that. It was kind of, it was like this foggy mist or, um, I could read you other passages, but um, here's a... Um, here's another passage um, that that's kind of that's kind of interesting. So um, this is from the um, um, from chapters. This is from the Tianwan in the Huainanzi. But basically, it goes like this. So, who passed down the story of the far off ancient beginnings of things? How can we be sure what it was like before the sky and earth below had taken shape? Since none could penetrate that murk, when darkness and light were yet undivided. How do we know about the chaos of insubstantial forms? What manner of things are the darkness and light? How did the yin and yang commingle? How did they originate things and how change them? So it's talking about a time when there, was, there wasn't even yin and yang yet. There wasn't even darkness and light yet. So just like that position where the, um, you know, the, the, you know, the high ranking official, the general, whoever it was, this personage, could either sit there or not. Um, we we the, there wasn't yet a, a yin or a yang. We we they couldn't be def, they couldn't really be defined. 
So this this notion of shoes, it's not limited to just uh, it's not limited to um, this notion of of sort of like when you say nothingness or the void. People have this tendency, at least I do, to think of outer space. You know, to just think of you know where where there's nothing. You know, or even though space really isn't empty, we tend to think of it that way. So there's stars and you're out there. It's just this vacuum. But for the Chinese, it, it wasn't that. It was actually imminent in everyday reality and it was imminent in consciousness. So um, one example of how things could be shu comes from my uh, study of painting. So in Chinese painting, they talk about the shi. The shi part of the painting are the, the definite parts where you could say, oh, well, that's an eye and that's a, um, you know, that's a branch. And the shu parts aren't just the empty part on the page, which could be the, the background or the light or anything else. It could also be the parts of the painting where you're, you're not sure. Maybe it's moss, maybe it's the light glinting off of the water, maybe it's um, another blossom or something like that. So um, one way that you could um, kind of illustrate this concept is with a, um, um, a device that, that, uh, that Wittgenstein used. Um, Wittgenstein is a uh, philosopher of the, the 20th century. And anyway, I don't want to get into all that, but this was a drawing that he used to uh, kind of play with um, the, uh, the, the, the people that he was talking to. So in looking at this, um, just you can just ask yourself here, what, what animal do you kind of see here? You know, if you saw an animal, what do you see? My drawing's bad, but this is essentially, this drawing, you could either see it as a duck, or, and, you know, work with me here. But you could see it as a duck, you know, with the eye and the beak. Or you could see it as a rabbit with the eye here and the ears back there. So this is Wittgenstein's duck rabbit. So the interesting thing with the duck rabbit is you sitting there can look at this. And you sitting there, you can see it as a duck or you can see it as a rabbit. Whatever that device is in the mind, whatever's going on there, that, that collection of uh, of um, you know neurons or whatever it is whatever's going on there you can look at it and you can look at it as a duck and you can even imagine it you know eating some food you can you can really see it that way or you can instantly flip and see it no it's a rabbit it's looking up as maybe a bit of, too long of a neck for a rabbit but it's it's definitely a rabbit there this type of drawing this aspect is she When you can flip it back and forth, when it's cognitively, when you when there's that like kind of cognitive plasticity, and you can flip it back and forth, it's she. When it becomes solid, when it's definitely a duck. So if you took like a photograph of a duck, and you could see the duck in just that way, then it's she. Then it's not. Maybe it's there, and maybe it isn't. Then it's like. Oh no, definitely. We're here undercover. I'm looking right at it. It's a cowrie shell and it's worth this amount. It's a duck or it's a rabbit. It's shu. Um, so that's kind of, if you think about the kind of early cosmos, it, this, this notion here where you can look between it being a duck and a rabbit, it would be that times, you know, it would be that at kind of an infinite level. So it wouldn't just be a duck or a rabbit or something else. It could be everything at once or kind of nothing at once like you're the it would be kind of infinitely undefined so that you know you could really almost see you could maybe see anything in it but because you could see anything in it you can't see anything in it because it 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 never really defines itself it never really becomes uh kind of one thing or or the other um i, I hope that uh kind of makes sense i, I find it fascinating um, to think about uh, in terms of early Chinese cosmology and also to know that this was the kind of the earliest uh, cosmological model and it, it fits very well with um, um, what we're kind of learning about the, the universe. Um, it also, of course, fits with um, this notion of induction versus causality because with induction, where you don't have things separated in time, rather you have them separated um, in place, um, you have a universe where there is the possibility for what um, Carl Jung referred to as uh, synchronicity. So this was 
in, in my mind, in, in my own readings, um, this notion of synchronicity, of course, uh, Jung used the, uh, the German term But it's essentially the same word, synchronicity, this synchronicity. Um, so I, probably my first introduction to Chinese cosmology at all, and maybe the same for you, was the uh, Wilhelm Barnes translation of the I Ching. And one of the coolest things about that book is it has, a, I can't remember if it's a preface or an introduction, but it has some writing by Carl Jung at the very beginning of it. And he introduces this notion of synchronicity. And so for, for Jung, he was astounded by what he was witnessing. So he uh, noticed, for instance, that, um, or didn't notice, but he was uh, treating a, a particular woman. He was a psychologist and he was treating her and he was having trouble getting her to kind of uh, see uh, the things around her or that she was experiencing as having any kind of meaning beyond themselves. So she was kind of stuck in this kind of mundane, kind of causal understanding of the, the, the universe. And he had her um, uh, recounting her dreams. And in, in one of the dreams, she had a very vivid dream of this golden scarab. And this golden scarab was kind of in her dream and she, um, uh, thought that it was, you know, somehow meaningful. And of course, for Jung, it, it had a whole kind of rubric of archetypal meanings and whatnot. So she was starting to just get a, a, a glimmer or a sense that whatever was going on with her wasn't just limited to her own, her own locality, her own world. It was somehow connected with something bigger through her dreams. And right at that time, Jung had the window to his office open and in flew a one of these the, kind of the closest thing to this kind of golden scarab beetle it's a metallic looking beetle with kind of a goldish or metallic hue it flew into this otherwise dark room which was kind of against its thing as she as she just concludes um talking about this dream of this golden beetle and that was the breakthrough in his treatment of her because she was kind of on the verge of believing that somehow what she was um, experiencing was connected to the larger cosmos. But when this beetle kind of entered into uh, this golden beetle so that she'd never even seen before had, had, had come in through this window in, in Austria, she suddenly believed that there was some kind of meaning. So she, she, she slipped from a causal understanding of the universe where things occur separated in time, but, um, uh, things, things occur separated in time, but occur simultaneously in place uh, to an inductive understanding of the universe where she was somehow connected with the larger cosmos in terms of space and time was sort of the, uh, the illusion there. So that's this, this notion of synchronicity. But Jung goes on to, um, he uses this, this idea to um, discuss the I Ching and discuss his own readings in the I Ching. So, um, this brings me back, I think, to uh, uh, something that I've touched on, I think, in each of the earlier lectures, which was the, the very beginning of Chinese writing, um, Chinese written thought. It began with these, um, these oracle bone, um, so if you, these oracle bone uh, readings. So in the, in the earliest Chinese writings, it's, it's what's called Jiagu Wan. Which is, Jia refers to this, um, this tortoise plastron. Gu is bone, and then Wan is script. So the earliest writings that we have are from these tortoise plastrons. Um, Farmers would, in China, would often come, come across these, these plastrons with writings, with these glyphs on them, but they didn't know, you know what they were necessarily. It wasn't until um, 1899 that um, uh, a scholar named Wang Yi Rong, who, uh, who collected these um, turtle plastrons, realized that they were actually the earliest form of Chinese writing. 
before that, people didn't really know what they were. And prior to him discovering their, um, their value as uh, archaeological um, elements, they, were, they would be ground up and used as dragon bones, so longu, which is still used in uh, Chinese medicine to, uh, sedate the, uh, to sedate empty fire, especially as it relates to the, um, uh, to the heart mind. So it can be used to kind of bring down a kind of a deficient or empty fire in, in the mind. Um, we could go into that too, because it, that's also very, um, that's also, I think, very, um, a very meaningful use of it. Um, the notion that somehow these things that were used as uh, oracles to determine one thing or the other, you know, this question that might be vexing someone and keeping them up at night, they would, you know, do a, a, a divination to determine the result. And that would then set them at ease, would then soothe them. And then, you know, 2,000 years later, people are actually taking these these bones, these farmers and things, and they're, they're grinding them up and putting them into water to, again, sedate people's, uh, you know, people that are kind of vexed by these, this, this empty heart fire, which is characterized by the mind kind of constantly rambling and being, you know, you get in bed at night and you're just thinking about this, that, and the other thing, and all these little worries that are, that are uh, keeping you from staying awake at night, you're worried about what's gonna happen tomorrow, and, you know, is this because of that, and is that because of this? Um, Anyway, the, um, these turtle plastrons, the fact that they use these for their divinations is interesting because the turtle, um, uh, there's a book, I can't remember the author just off the top of my head, but it's called The Shape of the Turtle. It's early Chinese cosmology. Um, but this shape of the turtle was the earliest kind of cosmological model. So heaven was seen as, as round or circular and the earth was seen as a square. Um, and in the turtle's shape, you have this bottom part here, which is the plastron, and then you have the upper part, which is rounded, this, which is called the carapace. The carapace is interesting, not just because it's round, but in it, you also have, a, around the very top of, the, um, of the, this round part at the, at the top, you have exactly 13, they all have exactly 13, and I'm, I may screw it up here, but um, it all has exactly 13 of these scales. Okay, I'll have, to, I'll have to add a couple. Anyway, they all have exactly 13 of these um, kind of scales around, around this part of this, this upper part there. So why 13 and why would that matter? Well, if you take 13 and you multiply it by 28, you'll have the kind of the earliest um, uh, calendar of the, um, you know, the, that the ancients might have used in an attempt to kind of link the solar and the, the lunar calendars into kind of months and whatnot. They could take uh, a period of 28 or, or 29 days. And if you multiply that by 13, you come very close to the, the solar year where the, the year comes back around again. So in any case, the carapace at the top represented the, the heavens. But the heavens, of course, are all these forces outside of, our, outside of what we can actually affect. And even though they're up there and we see them, even though we see Jupiter and we see Mars and we see Venus in the sky, we can't really do anything to them. They're just kind of out there. And also, whatever happens up there really doesn't affect us. Even though, even though in the inductive model they were connected, it's not like we're worried about Venus's light. We're worried about something that's happening right down here on Earth, something that we're concerned about, a, a battle that's coming up, or an illness that's afflicting ourselves or someone that we love, or a hunt that's coming up where the, maybe the king is, is worried about whether or not he's, gonna, he's going to get any uh, game or whether or not he's going to catch a tiger. So that part of it, this bottom part here, represented the, the earth the, where, where people were walking on. And there, not only does it have this, these kind of angles, these square angles, but it also has, it, and you can look this up online or whatever, but if you, if you look at one of these turtle plastrons, it has this, this square with squares in it. So it has a, at the bottom of the turtle plaster, it has this, this system of squares, with very much a picture of like the kind of square thing there. So what the, um, what the ancients would do then is they would write in this earliest kind of script, they would write some kind of, um, in their, with their oracle bone, with their oracle bone script, they would write some kind of question on the side here. And it might be something like, um, 
uh, in a week's time, it will be propitious for me to go forth in battle against this other kingdom. That might be what, what would be written there. It would be written as a statement. It wouldn't be written as a question. It would be written as a statement. That statement would be there, and then a hole would be drilled. There'd be a hole drilled in the plastron, and a blade of some kind would be used, a very sharp blade would be used to make a line this way and that, going this way or that. Then, on this end of the line, they would have a solid line, and on this end, they would have a broken line. The solid line would be a shrill line. With This part here would be the We refer to this notion of, so it would be a definite, it would be affirmative. And this line here, it wouldn't be a yes or a no, it would be a yes or a maybe. This line here would be she. So then they would apply heat to it, and it would make a noise, a noise. The the uh, the plastron would crack in one direction or the other, but the heat, the stress of the heat, would re be released through either one crack or the other. And so it was. Um, it's referred to as like a pleomancy, like a um, uh, um, um, or or pyromancy because fire was also used. But it was, you know, this notion of using the plastron, the pleo, the plastron to arrive at some result, but there was also heat involved. There was also fire involved. So it was kind of a mix between pyromancy and, and pleomancy. But the, um, the, the crack that was formed, this part here, it would, it would make a line like this. And this is still the, um, the radical that refers to uh, divination. So this can be pronounced poo or, or boo, uh, but in the, they've managed to kind of piece together the earliest, pronunci earliest pronunciation of this character, and it was originally translated like pook. So here you have this, this line that would, would crack either, you know, would, would run this way or the other, and it would make this pook sound, um, and that would um, uh, give you this, this um, this uh, prognostication, but but this is what I think is most interesting about it, because it's it's not saying it, they're not saying either this will happen or that will happen. It's either saying it may happen, if it it's either saying yes it will happen or it's saying maybe it will happen or maybe it won't. So what I think is interesting about that is it still it still provides this this idea at, that the desired result, or whatever it is that the, um, the, um, the diviner, the king, is interested in, there's still the possibility of it happening, but it isn't happening right then. And the, um, at this time when they were doing this type of um, pyromancy, they were obsessed with this notion that um, the an their ancestors could have some effect on the world um, that they were in. So um, there were there were a lot of, you know, essentially kind of blood sacrifices and things that were done. Even this this plastron, when they find them, they they were first bathed in blood before they would do this um, this type of um, uh, pyromancy. They would first kind of there's some notion that that blood would kind of feed or or um, assuage the uh, or or like propitiate. The, um, their dead ancestors, and those would have some sort of effect on the, um, their present day world. So there are examples where the same question is asked repeatedly until they get the kind of the, the result that they, they want. But between one, uh, between one kind of reading and the next, we don't really know what would happen, but we do oftentimes find there'll be a question asked, then there will be oracle bones where they're asking, what is it that the ancestors want? Do they want this or do they want that? Then there, then there will be an oracle bone where they'll ask the question again and they'll either get you know, a definite yes or a maybe. So there, somehow there was this, in this early kind of understanding, there was this 
some kind of uh, notion that they could not only ascertain what was going on out in the world, but they could figure out how to um, affect it, you know, somehow figure out how to have some sort of effect on uh, the kind of causal reality through like inductive means. I, I know I went all over the place and I, I wanted to get to how these concepts are used in terms of an understanding of the human body and how they relate to health and disease. But um, this is really kind of the foundation of that type of, of, of understanding what it means in the body. So I'm glad we covered this. Um.